Hi, I'm Lucy, a second year PhD student in the group, and I'm going to show you how to load a sample into our squid magnetometer and measure its magnetization as a function of applied field. I'm working with metal oxides, so today I'm looking at a thin film of scantium doped zinc oxide grown on a sapphire substrate. Our squid samples are loaded into plastic straws first, and here I'm demonstrating how to do so for in-plane measurements. So that is, the field is applied in the plane of the film. So first we place the sample into the straw, and then squeeze down gently to move it towards the centre. The substrates that we're using here are 5mm by 5mm in area. Then we need to push the sample gently to tilt it, so that two of the corners dig into the sides of the straw and hold it in place. As you can see, the sample is vertically oriented in the straw, and here I'm just showing a sample that has been set up for an out-of-plane measurement as an example. You can see that now the film is perpendicular to the central axis of the straw. We can cool down to as low as 4 Kelvin, but of course we can't load samples in at low temperatures like this. So now I've heated it back up, it's at about 300 Kelvin, which I can read on the screen here, and now I can load my sample. After selecting the Remove Sample button on the software, the sample space is vented. Once it is ready, I can remove the cap and slowly pull the rod out. As you will see, we attach the plastic straw containing our sample to the end of the rod. There will be an additional diamagnetic contribution from the substrate on top of the signal from the thin film sample. At the end, we have to correct the data to remove this contribution. And don't forget the cap. Now I twist gently to carefully remove the sample that was already in there, and I can pop my own one on. We have a little piece to stick into the bottom of the straw too, just to catch the sample in case it falls during the measurement. So now I'm ready to load my sample. Again, I take the cap off, and then slowly lower my sample down. Once the rod is fully in, I put the cap back on and then the chamber is purged of air and vented with helium gas. Now I need to centre the sample to make sure that it's at the centre of the squid pickup coils and I do this by clicking the centre button here. I click Initialize Transport to lower the sample down, and then in the parameters window I can define the scan length. I have set the length to 2 cm, so I want the centre to be at 1 cm. I adjust the position until I get this. Here you can see the voltage response curve and its fit. At the minimum here the sample is exactly centred between the coils, so you can see that this is ready to go. Now I need to choose a sequence to run, but I have one saved in my folder so I'll head to that straight away. I want to run a full loop, so from 5 tesla to minus 5 and then back to 5 tesla again, all at 300k. So I just like to check everything once more before I actually start the measurement, just to make sure everything's okay. So this is running away now, so I can come back in about 3 hours to check to see what my loop looks like. After correcting for the diamagnetic contribution of the substrate, we end up with something like this an anhistoretic ferromagnetic light signal for this D0 material. Also, take note of the magnitude of the magnetic moment on the y-axis. The squid is an extremely sensitive magnetometer. Hello, my name is Rai Zhang. I'm a PhD student in this group. This is the main part of the VSM instrument, which provides a magnetic field. The VSM can measure the powder, the bulk, or the liquid. And one thing we have to notice is how to prepare a proper sample to load. It requires a tightly packed sample. Here, we use aluminum foil, which is non-magnetic, to pack the sample. Then, we obtain a small ball to put on the sample holder. In order to obtain the reliable data, we need to load the standard sample nickel to do the calibration. This is the vibration rod. The sample holder will mount on it. Then, we move the rod to the center of the magnetic field gently.
After the calibration, now we can load the sample we have prepared. Following the program guidelines to finish the M versus H scan, here there are two type loops we have measured. One is magnet two gallon, which one shows the high hysteresis loop. The other one is a ferrofluid, which will just show a small hysteresis. Hello and welcome to my presentation. My name is Ajay Jha. I am a PhD student in Magnetism and Spin Electronics Group at Trinity College Dublin. In this presentation, I will talk about some of the measurement options available in our quantum design physical property measurement system. CPMS is a versatile tool where temperature and magnetic field can be varied in a wide range. It is a fully automated system with the normal temperature range from 2 Kelvin to 400 Kelvin and magnetic field up to plus minus 14 Tesla. The PPMS system allows us to measure various physical quantity of the sample such as electrical property, magnetic property and thermal property. These techniques will be discussed in the following slides. First, the electrical measurement. The standard resistance of the sample can be measured by mounting the sample on a three-channel resistive puck. It allows us to measure three samples simultaneously. As shown below, two samples have been configured to simultaneously measure the anomalous Hall effect in the thin film sample. The sample installation involves the locking a sample in the sample extraction tool and carefully placing inside the sample chamber. After that, a, a contact baffle is inserted in the sample space and finally clamping it in the place. The electrical connection of the sample can be made can be accessible with the gray lemo connector which has other terminal connected to a three channel bridge box. This allows us to externally bias and measure the sample as per our convenience. Moreover, the horizontal rotator allows us to rotate the sample in the presence of magnetic field. As shown here in the left hand side, the rotation perpendicular to the field. An example of such measurement is shown in the blue curve. Here, the anomalous Hall effect of Magnet Jerusalem gallium thin film is shown, which indicates the balanced torque experienced by magnetization vector as a function of angle. The in plane rotation of the sample is shown on the right hand side. The resultant four fold oscillation is shown in the red curve. Moving on, our in house made point contact and row reflection probe allow us to measure the differential conductance between normal metal and superconductor. This measurement is very useful to study the superconductivity and the spin polarization of the metals. The magnetic measurement options are also available in our lab. It, the DC VSM a uh, major uh, instrument has a sensitivity of 10 to the power minus 6 EMU. The sample can be mounted on various sample holders. In particularly, the high temperature VSM is accessible through VSM oven, which allows us to measure the magnetization up to 1000 Kelvin. Furthermore, our torque magnetometer option also provide the possibility to study the magnetic system. Last, last but not the least, the thermal measurements options. In this path, our heat capacity puck allows us to study a very sensitive calorimetry study. In addition, the thermal transport option helps us to measure thermal conductivity, thermoelectric effect and electrical resistivity. If required, all these three quantities can be measured simultaneously. With this very quick introduction, I before I conclude, I must say that this small presentation hardly justified the vers versatility of the PPMS measurement tool. With this, I would like to end my talk.
Thank you for your attention. Have fun with PPMS. Hello, my name is Niklas Teichert. I'm a postdoc working in this group and the tool I'm going to present is our care microscope. We have it in the lab for almost three years now and it is mainly used to visualize magnetic domains in thin films and microstructures. The care microscope or polarization microscope is basically just a modified optical microscope. It has a light source over here. The incoming light gets polarized at this polarization filter before it travels through the objective lens and reflects off the sample that is placed in a perpendicular magnetic field. The light then travels through a second polarization filter, the analyzer, before it hits the CCD camera. I'm now going to mount a sample. We are going to look at a one nanometer thick cobalt layer sandwiched between two very thin platinum layers. I'm just going to place it here under the objective lens, where you can see four spots of red light that are coming from our LED light source. In order to mount the sample, we had the microscope cranked up a bit, so I'm lowering it down now and fix it in place before I carefully use the focus wheel that is on the other side to bring our sample in focus. On the screen, we have the live image from the CCD camera, and as you can see, we are slowly getting in focus. And here we are. Now I am slotting in these two pole pieces that I use to guide the magnetic field lines for maximum field at the sample. This way we can apply up to one Tesla of magnetic field strength. So here we see the surface of our thin film sample. In order to see the weak magnetic contrast, I am going to digitally subtract the image that we currently see. And we are now looking at a differential image that shows strongly reduced contrast from the film's topography in order to bring out the magnetic domains. Now I am applying a magnetic field that is close to the coercivity of the sample and we are going to witness the nucleation and growth of magnetic domains. We see the film changes to a brighter color as the initially downwards pointing magnetization gets reoriented upwards by the applied magnetic field until almost the whole visible area is saturated. By extracting the brightness information from the image, we can measure magnetic hysteresis curves where the intensity is plotted over the applied magnetic field. This way, we can extract magnetic information from samples with very low magnetic moment, like this thin cobalt layer, or even samples without any net magnetization, such as fully compensated ferrimagnets. These have two oppositely oriented magnetic sublattices that cancel each other out completely. However, the sublattices have different care effects so that the magnetic domains may still be visible. In this experiment, we applied the magnetic field perpendicular to the sample surface. However, we also have the option to apply the field in plane as seen here, or even to apply rotating magnetic fields. My name is Katarzyna and I am a postdoc in the Magnetism and Spintronics group. I will demonstrate how to prepare a thin film sample for magnetotransport measurements in a cryostat with a superconducting cryomagnet. I've put gloves on and I placed the sample onto a clean piece of clean room tissue using tweezers. The sample holder for the cryostat is made of brass and it has some vacuum grease on top to allow the sample to stick to it. I placed the sample onto the vacuum grease. and position it so that it's more or less in the middle, then the thin silver wire shown on the spool is cut into pieces and using silver paint, a wire is attached to each corner of the square sample. The other end of the wire is soldered onto the correct pin. Then I can bring it over to the cryostat. So because it's a cryomagnet, I first had to evacuate the air from the blanket around it in order to allow it to cool to, lo to low temperatures, such as 10 Kelvin. And I put a blank onto the opening to prevent any dust or dirt gathering inside. So after it's been blanked off, it's important to clear the area from any metal uh, components that could fall into the inside of the magnet when it's operational and could possibly damage the magnet. 
and this is the opening for the cryostat. So after clearing the area, I can now place the sample onto the cryostat. I bring it over, it's hanging from the ceiling with a crane, and the brass holder simply screws onto the end uh, of the cryostat onto the cold finger. Now we can wrap uh, the wires around the cryostat and connect them uh, onto the blue connector that you can see there. Voila! There it is, it's ready. So now we can put the shield. Uh, it's, a, it's a thermal shield. For low temperature measurements we would put two shields on, one with the smaller diameter, but in this case I'm just showing you the main big shield and at the top o-rings and some vacuum grease is placed to create a good 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 contact a good seal and then this whole thing can be put into the bore of the magnet by lowering the crane very carefully once the cryostat is in place i can remove the hooks of um, of the crane and the crane can be moved out of the way so now that everything is sort of ready we need to just now connect the temperature control and the current supply so here you can see the hoses that pump helium in and out of the cryostat and over there i'm just connecting now the temperature control like this and Lastly, but not least, I'm connecting the current supply to the cryostat. If uh, we were to do a cool down of the cryostat, we would have to evacuate air through this opening. Um, usually we would go down to pressures of uh, 10 to the minus 6 millibar. We have a valve that we can open and close after evacuating the air. And now, but everything is ready for the moment, we, if we want to just do room temperature measurements, and here I'm showing the lake shore where I can control the heater and uh, observe what the temperature is. There is the pins for the coaxial cables uh, that I connect in order to pass the current uh, uh, on the sample, and of course a Keithley source for the current that also measures the, the voltage and resistance. And everything's controlled uh, using a LabVIEW script. So you're ready to go.